This is me, Charles Darwin. And if I do look a bit worried, it's not really my fault. I just wanted to travel, collect stuff, examine it, and, well, explain how things change. Scientists do that, but accidentally I found something out that, well, caused a bit of trouble. Quite a lot of trouble. And it still does. That's me with my nanny in the window. I was born into a wealthy family in Shropshire, the youngest of five children. And there's father, the fat jolly one, just arriving home after a long day visiting patients. He's a clever doctor, you see. And my mother is waiting to say hello. I'm still small, but I'm the naughty one. But I was clever as well. Too clever, maybe. I was always getting up to mischief as a boy. Here's me stealing apples from the orchard, something my dad told me not to do. Uh-oh, trouble again. This time, I knocked an expensive vase off the table with my ball. Oh, my sister Caroline gets cross. She's always telling me off. What I really like doing is fishing and collecting things that I find, like uh, pebbles, tadpoles, and little insects, planty things, shells. I was sent to boarding school when I was nine years old. Ooh, I found the lessons so boring. Sports are what I like, and I like running around outside. <laughs> My teacher gets furious with me. Darwin, back here this minute. At our house, my older brother Erasmus built a laboratory in the garden shed. I was allowed to be his assistant. We used to do really dangerous experiments and blow things up. But we also made proper notes in books and tried to be like real scientists. When I was grown up, my father insisted that I went to Edinburgh University so that I could train to be a doctor like he was and like his father before him. But when you are learning to become a doctor, you have to watch operations where they cut people open, which just made me sick. Doctoring was definitely not for me. I didn't enjoy watching operations, but what I did like was taxidermy. <laughs> which has nothing to do with taxis. It's stuffing dead animals. I met a clever and interesting man, John Edmonston, who taught me. He used to be a slave. He came from South America, and he told me exciting stories about the jungles there. Maybe that's why I got the urge to travel. Charles, my dad said, you're clearly not cut out for doctoring. So. I went off to Cambridge to learn about religion. But I didn't do much work there either. My father thought I was a total good-for-nothing. You just like shooting and drinking and having fun, he shouted. <coughs> well, it was sort of true. My family had a lot of money, and I knew I didn't need to work. And I had a lot of friends who were just rich like me, and we loved having fun together. I was drawn to the outdoor life. And when I went walking around Wales, I got really interested in the plants, rocks, and animals that I saw. Oh, beetles. I loved them. One day, I remember walking down a path when I saw three. I picked one up, and then I picked the other up. And then, because I had no hands left, I had to pop the third one in my mouth. It wriggled around a bit, but there was no other place to put it. One day, I got a letter inviting me to join a ship called the Beagle. It was going on a long journey to make maps round the world. I was offered an unpaid job as the ship's naturalist, collecting plants and animals. I begged my father, please let me go, father, please. And after some thought, he agreed. Then I had to meet the captain of the Beagle, Charles Fitzroy, and make sure he wanted me to come along. We would spend five years together, so it was important that we got along well. Not least because the cabin space was really squashed. 
I had to sleep with my feet in a drawer, and there was hardly any room to move. Always someone's dirty socks on your bed, or their bottom in your face, or snoring in your ear. And I got terribly seasick. I'm not cut out for a sailor's life. The journey on the Beagle was quite dangerous too. Sometimes the local people on land weren't very friendly. Then we saw earthquakes where the ground beneath our feet split open. And we met lots of people suffering from horrible diseases. So, who was on board our ship, the Beagle? Well, there was the captain, of course, and the sailors. And then there was an artist. We didn't have cameras then, so his job was to make pictures of everything we saw. As the naturalist, my job was to make notes about all the animals we found. I collected insects. I stuffed animals, found bones and fossils and interesting rocks, and wrote a diary, which you can still read today. The Voyage of the Beagle. Whenever I could, I sent boxes of the stuff I found back to England. We stopped at a small group of islands called the Galapagos Islands. The things we saw there. Snakes, lizards, birds, and beasts of every kind. I've never seen so many weird and wonderful animals in my life. Giant tortoises, so big you could ride them. And so delicious you could roast them and eat them for supper. When I find unusual things, it makes me ask questions. On the Galapagos Islands, there lived a small bird, a kind of finch. But each of these birds had a different beak, perfect for eating the food on each different island where it lived. On one island lived Mr. Nutcracker, and he had a thick, strong beak for cracking open nuts and seeds. On another island lived Mrs. Insect Muncher, and she had a neat pointy beak for picking up those teeny bugs. And elsewhere I found Mrs. Worm Yanker. She had a long, thin beak for digging out worms. And what about Mr. Flower Nibble? His beak was big and roomy to fit all those flowers. I thought about this for a long while. Each beak was perfect for the island where the bird lived. Once they were all the same bird, all with the same beak. Why did they change? And another thing. How come I found shells at the top of a high mountain? Can you answer that? I had an idea, but I wasn't sure. I needed to think about it some more. But when I arrived home after five long years at sea, other things were on my mind. Seeing my family and friends, and I thought about getting married. I wrote myself a list to work it out. A nice wife makes cups of tea and looks after you, and you can have lots of lovely children. And she's a friend for when you grow old and wrinkly. On the other hand, you can't hang around with your friends when you're married, and you might argue a lot, and you might get really fat and lazy. Emma Wedgwood, my cousin, made up my mind for me. She was from a rich family, famous for making china plates and cups. I proposed marriage to her. It was to be the best decision I ever made. My home life was very happy. We did have a huge, jolly family, and my children were even more important to me than my work as a natural scientist. I wrote a book about the amazing things I saw on my journey. Remember those finches with their differently shaped beaks, each perfect for finding food on the different islands where they lived. Maybe all living things change slowly, fitting better into their surroundings. Those finches all came from the same family, but they settled in different places with different food. And over hundreds of years, thousands maybe, their beaks became special tools that got better and more specialized with each generation. 
Anne, what about those shells I found high up on a mountain? I thought, maybe, the earth too was slowly changing all the time. What if the ground had moved and the bottom of the sea, full of shells, had grown very slowly to become the top of the mountain? And maybe once, a long time ago, before we had clothes, we looked a bit like this. This idea that everything is changing or evolving slowly over many years, I called my theory of evolution. But it was a difficult thing to tell people. Why? Well, because people thought the world and everything in it has always been the way we see it today. It was made that way. And because I don't like upsetting people, I thought it best to lock this idea away for a while. Oh, much better. And to go to work on something no one argues about. My barnacles and my earthworms. I published my book 20 years later. Goodness, what a reaction. Some people agreed with my ideas, but many others were upset. The bishops in the church were shocked. Charles Darwin, what a ridiculous idea. That we are related to monkeys is nonsense, they said. Queen Victoria was horrified. I am horrified and elderly. That was me, Charles Darwin. I died 73 years old. My theory of evolution had slowly been accepted by more and more people. But a hundred years later, my thoughts still cause big arguments as people wonder about the world and how it changes. Any ideas? <laughs>